Luke 18, 1 through 8. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Yeah, the way to attack you. That's scary. That's right. So, yeah, I feel like this passage is kind of relevant for us as we each week have been praying to get into the theater space to have Crucible. Um, obviously, yeah. maybe that's not the type of right, prayer right. Jesus is asking us to pray, but it feels like we're being persistent. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's impossible, I guess, not to read a, a passage like this and read your your immediate human experience into it. I mean, that's what we that's what we do. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm sure several of us around here and around the network, you know. Um, uh, maybe read a passage like this and feel. I, it was my initial when I was reading it, just feeling like God deliver, <laughs> persistently praying for this theater, and 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 even feeling like even feeling like these city people, they do not fear God or people. <laughs> they do not care for people. <laughs> um, and uh, and and really yearning to to finally be in this theater. Um, but I, I mean, I think it's, it's uh, of course, that's not what this passage is about, but I think it brings up an astute point, right? I mean, it, it, it begs the question, if Jesus is telling this to his disciples, then do, do me as a disciple, um, ev- everyone in every place about anything, does this apply? To, to, does God want you to pray persistently? And that apply to anyone, anywhere, about anything? And of course, I mean, we, we know the answer would be, would be no, but then where, where's the line? What is it that, that we pray persistently for? I mean, can I pray persistently for uh, a, a better living situation? And God's going to hear me. Can I pray persistently for... Uh, if I'm a college student for, for a, a job that's going to help me get through college, can I pray persistently for, you know, there's obviously selfish things that you could pray for, and, and we know immediately, like, that's not what's being talked about here. But there are even noble things that you feel like you could pray persistently for. But I don't know if that's what's being talked about here. That's what's being discussed here. Um, I mean, again, take the theater, for example. We're, we're not, I hope, I hope, we're not really praying persistently for three weeks, four weeks, five weeks for a building. That's not what we're paying, pr- praying for. That's, we're not praying for square footage and chairs and a space. What we're praying for and yearning for is the ability to gather as the people of God in worship, to, to hear from Him, encounter Him, be transformed by Him among our family. I miss that. You miss that. I, every week, I'm hoping that we can have that again. I, I, I hunger for it. And that doesn't feel like a selfish desire. That feels like a, a, a good desire to want that. And yet we don't have it. Um, is, that what, is, is that okay to persistently pray for or not? Um, and I would think with the, with the parable that he chooses, the story that he chooses, he, he definitely puts a highlight on matters of justice and righteousness, the righteousness of God indwelling in the world, the kingdom of God invading the world, um, and all of its implications for justice. And if you take that into consideration, that the things that we pray persistently for is the fruition of the kingdom of God 
and it's it's matters of peace and justice and the righteousness of God being revealed in the world, then yeah, maybe maybe us us you know being able to gather every single week um, might might not be <laughs> a matter. And and actually maybe it's a, a a grace, a bit of a gift from God to not answer that prayer of ours for a few weeks, uh, because somehow maybe it's a gift for us as the underground to be reminded for a season of one of these core these core ideas that we cling to that what it means to be the people of God has nothing to do with a building or a weekly meeting. But those things are good and they're they're amazing and they're gifts that we get to experience. But there are churches around the world that do not have those luxuries. And for us for three weeks to, to somehow remember and not to take for granted uh, uh, that type of space, that type of gathering that, we, that God has given us. Um, but you also bring up another, another point, and I, and I think that point is how we locate ourselves in the story. Uh, you know, t- to what extent are we the persistent widow? To what extent um, do we align ourselves with the, the persistent widow? Um, uh, last semester, I, I, I went to play basketball with, at the YMCA with Josh Hopp. It was uh, the first time I played basketball, I think, in f- four years, maybe five years. And I, I, when I, in high school, I would like to think, maybe my memory is flawed, but I would like to think that I held my own in basketball. I, I like, would at least not embarrass myself. I could play and figure it out. Um, but uh, I don't know. I just, Josh and I went after work to play basketball. We were, I was lacing up my shoes. We, got, we were on two different teams and you know, meeting all the other guys we were playing with and everything. And then we were about to get ready to go. And I just thought, yeah, for my team, they were all asking me, what do you, what do you want to play? You, you have a certain position, whatever. I just thought, yeah, guys, I'll be, you know, I'll just, I'll play point guard. It's fine. I'll control the game. It's okay. It's no big deal. <laughs> and I'm telling you, like, within the first 10 minutes of playing, uh, I had not, I'd shot, I'd, I'd made several shots and had not yet hit the rim. Um, I, uh, I felt like I was going to vomit within like two or three minutes. Um, I'd throw the, throw in the ball straight out of bounds two or three times, trying to make very basic passes. Uh, and the, the, at the beginning, the, the guys on my team were being very gracious with me, like, it's cool, shake it off, man, no problem. But after about three or four minutes, I could tell there was a little frustration maybe brewing in the team. And uh, it all, everything culminated in this moment where I, I was going up for a, a defensive rebound a very basic rebound. The ball is coming right to me, and it goes through my hands, hits my face, and goes directly to one of the other, to the other team, and they just have this really easy layup off my face. And uh, uh, and it was around that moment that I realized that when I approached this basketball game, I did not locate myself in the story of this basketball game very accurately. I, I was not very self-aware about my position in this game. Um, and for the rest of the game, I, I uh, was a distributor. I just kind of st- st- sat in the corners. You want to pass me the ball? It's cool. I'll give you a break. I'll hold on to it. You let, when you're ready, I'll pass it right back. You just take a breather. I'm a, I'm, you, right to me. It's fine. I'm over here. I'm available. Uh, and I accurately located myself with my skill level in the game. And, and in, in view of... The, the game that was about to, to play, I had options of who I would be in that game, and I located myself in that story in a way that was not true and did not end well. And I, my, some of my anxiety a little bit about this text, my discomfort with this text, is, is um, both myself and consistently seeing others immediately locating themselves in the text as the persistent widow and wondering... Uh, uh, what it means to be to be faithful to the story as the persistent widow. But there's another character in the story. There is an adversary. And in every matter of injustice, there are both the oppressed and oppressors. And I think history is filled with oppressors who have located themselves in this text as a persistent widow. 
um, on matters that, that should not be aligned. And I think that I and I think that's damaging, not just because those who are under oppression um, uh, 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 should be re re receiving some of the weight of this text, but also because I think there's good news, there's important news in this text for oppressors. For and and it's not even people who are who are in like direct oppression of other people, but even people who are. Are, are culpable within systems of oppression and benefit from systems of oppression. And realizing that the oppressed are praying persistently against that oppression, and you have to understand that in that system of oppression, you are aligned with the adversary. And to, and to be able to, to receive and know that and to see a picture of, of, of a God who does not wait any longer. To see a picture of, of a God who, who uh, the, the time is ticking, and he stands on behalf of the oppressed, and there is hope for the adversary, there is hope for the oppressor, but it's through the, through the path of repentance, and through seeing that God for who he is, not, not an unjust judge who does not care for people, but actually a just God who cares very much about, the, about matters of justice in the world and those who are oppressed. And to actually see, see that God, to confront the reality of that God, and then to repent and disentangle from those systems of oppression that we're culpable within. And it's not, it's not a binary forever choice. It's not like you're forever a persistent widow or you're forever an adversary. There, it's, 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 there's different times you're going to approach this, this text and you can locate yourself as either one. But you, the, the option has to be on the table to locate yourself as the adversary because there is a response for that person here too. Um, this is one of those rare parables where Jesus actually says on the front end, this is the point. We don't have to guess and try to interpret. He's saying this is the point. He, he, he actually says, uh, I'm telling you this to, to show you uh, that you should always pray and not give up. So he's saying, it's not us interpreting, he's saying you should always pray and not, you should persist, you should persevere in prayer. But then the, the punchline of the whole story is that God is not like the unjust judge. He delights in delivering justice and he does so quickly. He does not delay. So we have these two truths. We have, we have you, should, you should always pray and not give up. You should persist in prayer. And God delights in, de in delivering justice, and he acts quickly. So in theory, you shouldn't have to persist <laughs> because he acts quickly. So what do we do with those two things? How do, how do we hold those two things together? I, and I think with so many other things in Scripture, it's, it's hard to see the, the whole picture of this parable without at the same time including what, what came before it. I mean, this, this parable comes in partnership uh, with the parable before it. You can tell because of the way it starts, that first line. Then Jesus said, uh, you know, in immediate, immediately he also said this. Um, and that, that previous passage is, is all about waiting for the vindication of your suffering on the coming of the day of the Son of Man. It's about, it's about uh, uh, persevering in this world, the brokenness of this world, uh, the, the injustices of this world, and clinging to hope, clinging to the promises of God, clinging to, 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 uh, uh, clinging to, to who He is, to, to His character, to His commitment to you, and that hope not failing you, and, and persevering all the suffering that comes with that, and then that suffering being vindicated on the day of the Son of Man. And the point of what comes right before this is to say, the way that you uh, uh, wait for that vindication is by focusing on the promise of the coming kingdom, by focusing on the promise of the new, the new world order that is coming. And then, and then he says this. Then he says, you should always pray and not give up. Um, almost like the way in which you focus on the coming kingdom is by persisting in prayer, by, by, by grounding your life in prayer.
and last night, I mean, mo most, I mean, you both, you both know I just had a baby on Christmas Day. Um, so said baby is like a month old now. And um, I, I was trying to, I was hoping to spend some time last night just praying and thinking about what to say this morning to the community. But that, that baby, Jackson, uh, just would not sleep, <laughs> would not sleep a wink. So all night, uh, we're, we're trying to, you know, calm him down and try to get through the night. I mean, early infancy parenting is just like survival. So we're just trying to survive last night. And I'm, and I'm at the same time trying to think about what it is that the Lord wants to say this morning. But I can't write anything down. I can't, I can't get on my computer and try to type out my thoughts. I can't get, on a, get in a journal or write anything down. So I'm just stuck praying with my own mind. And, and maybe that was a gift. I really felt like in the night, I just felt like the Lord kind of gave me this image of, uh, of a boat being tossed around at sea, tossed, tossed around by massive waves in a storm. And I th and it's it's uh, it's my um, uh, uh, I think that that boat was representative of the underground, partially because it wasn't like a yacht or a super nice boat. It was like a pirate ship. <laughs> it was like it was like a, it was like we bought that boat on Craigslist. That's what we did. And um, and it just being kind of like in this crazy storm, but but uh, you could see the end of the storm coming in the distance, and beyond that 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 storm front was just glass water just peace the stillness but we're just like weathering these waves and there's this crowd of maybe 20 or 30 people on the deck of this boat and we're all together holding this anchor this massive anchor that not one person could hold and while we're trying to weather this storm uh, uh, we have to ground the ship we have to we have to somehow we have to somehow uh, firmly establish ourselves in the ground to weather these waves and to wait on this future promise coming for us. We can see it; it's coming. Um, and we're all we're all holding on to the anchor, and we're we're waiting to drop it all together. Everybody is a part, waiting to drop it. And that anchor is what's going to fall and ground us, hold us in the midst of this storm. And uh, I was just, all night, I was just kind of like wrestling with that and wrestling with this passage and, uh, and, and what that means and, and, and wrestling what it means for that anchor to be, not just, not just praying over a meal or praying before a meeting or, 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 or praying before you have an event or, or praying before you go to bed or so, something like that, but like having a life that is baptized in persistent, dependent, unwavering prayer. Um, that's, that somehow, uh, if, if we are to be people who weather the storm, we must focus on our and be grounded in our future hope, our future promise uh, uh, of the kingdom, of a just world. Uh, but we can't actually focus on that promise. We can't be grounded in that promise without this work of prayer, which both reminds us of that future kingdom and he, and God literally in the place of prayer assures us that it's coming. Um, so are you anchoring your life in prayer? Are you, are you, are you dropping the anchor? Uh, is your microchurch letting go of that anchor? Or are you holding on to the anchor and just being tossed about by the waves and looking to the future and hoping it'll come? Because if you don't drop the anchor, He will return and he will not find faith on the earth. That, that, that somehow he made a promise and people committed to, to unwavering uh, 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 rootedness in that promise. And, and even, even persevered some suffering, hoping for the vindication of that hope. But somewhere along the way, they gave up on that promise. They let go of that promise. They let go of that, of that hope. And I wonder if the first step in letting that go of that hope is picking up the anchor or not letting it down in the first place. So I think this passage, you know, 
obviously is encouraging us to be persistent in prayer, what you're saying, to hold on to the hope that we are assured is coming. Um, but, I mean, I think we all know people who have persistently prayed for things yeah. and have not seen them come to fruition. Um, so what do we do with that tension? Yeah. Yeah, that's hard. I mean, um, like we mentioned briefly earlier, I mean, there are, I think there are some things that we, that we might persistently pray for that are not actually matters of justice and righteousness in the world. And he won't answer those. Um, and even if they feel good or noble, not even selfish, not like a car or a house or something like that, like they, they, they feel like this should be something that God wants. Um, and, and if it's not in line with his righteousness in the world, then he won't answer them. But I actually think the longer we persist in the place of prayer over the long haul, we, we gain clarity around, around the justice of God. What is the justice of God? And there are things that we maybe persistently prayed for five years ago that we wouldn't even think about praying for now as we grow clarity about what that even is, what the kingdom is that's coming. But there are things that, that, are, that are definitely in line with the justice of God, the righteousness of God in dwelling this world that we could persistently pray for for years and years and we still do not see come. And we might not even see progress. We might, we might struggle to see progress on them. Um, and, and I think, I think uh, uh, p part of what we might wrestle with is what it actually means for God to act quickly on our prayers. You know, I think, I think the, immediate, um, uh, 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 the immediate answer that we might conclude to a question like that, partially because we want it to be true, is that what it means for God to act quickly is to actually manifest the vindication of that hope. To make right the wrong that we're experiencing, to, to, to relinquish the oppression that the oppressed are under and feel. And for that, that like real life, in reality, manifestation of the vindication of that hope, that's what, we, that's what we think is coming. That's what we think it means for God to act and act quickly. But I actually think it's, it's bigger than that. It's more than that. I, I, I think part of what's happening here is that we can persistently pray for the justice of God knowing that He already has acted quickly. That, that, we, that we have a ground on which to put our anchors. We, we have a hope in which to root ourselves because He came to us, because He went to death on a cross and, 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 and overcome, overcame our death on our behalf for us. That He took a death that was not His, that we were deserving of, and now we have a hope in Him that is everlasting. The unjust judge doesn't even do that. The, unjust, the, the judge that doesn't even hear, that is always turning away, he, he doesn't want to listen to anything. He doesn't want to do anything like that. He doesn't even want to offer a grounds for hope. But God has already acted for us before we even asked. He has already acted quickly for us before we even asked. And beyond that, when we ask, He gives us assurance of the hope that we have in Him. So He already established that hope in the past. And as we persistently pray, He is giving us in that moment, in, with Him, in Him, He is giving us assurance of that promise and that hope. And one day, He is going to vindicate that hope. One day, the injustices of this world are going to be eradicated. Um, and and the, 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 the rooting of our lives in the persistence of prayer uh, is, is a way for us to not just experience the assurance of that hope, but to ensure that we are there when he returns like lightning and he finds faith in the earth and a remnant. And I want to be counted along, among that remnant, don't you? So will you dip your life in the water of prayer, submerge your life in the water of prayer and not just, not just a, a shallow prayer here and there and not just selfish prayer, but, but prayers for the kingdom of God to be made manifest in your life, in the life of your microchurch, and in the life of this movement, and in this city, and in the world. To have your life rooted in the persistence of kingdom prayers is the invitation of this text.